Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Y'all made it through the holidays, more or less. <laughs> so we're glad you're here today. I used to have a, a psychologist friend who, when he had a, a new client, he would ask them, uh, kind of in the intake session, uh, what it was that they were joyful about. And he thought that people didn't pay enough attention to their joys, and so he listened really, really carefully to see what they were joyful about. He thought that was a kind of a pathway to understanding some things about people. So it's really interesting to sit back there every Sunday morning and psychoanalyze you and <laughs> let you have the chance to say what you're joyful about. And so uh, that's, that's pretty neat. I don't think we do enough of that. Uh, maybe we ought to have a New Year's resolution that says we're going to uncork a joy jar every morning and put our joys in. I think it's really nice to remember parents like you did. That's a that's a very nice thing that we often don't do very much of. And, uh, I, I actually thought you were pretty kind about Georgia and, and, and Texas. And, uh, it's too bad we're not as much into basketball. Boy, we could really be filling that joy jar. <laughs> That doesn't mean that Tennessee just beat Georgia 96 to 50 this week. But we won't say we won't say anything about that. And and then I noticed that uh, Jeannie put m money in for your 50th birthday. I thought that was pretty nice. But then I don't always cl hear clearly back there. Is it true that you put money in for a quiet ride home from Florida? Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to take that home you're going to own that now <laughs> but we are glad everybody's here today and that we can start off a new year and we hope that people will have plenty of health and that there will be a few sorrows and those kind of things and I, I appreciate you uh, uh, so much do Sam Payne he, he really was a really neat guy uh, who touched a lot of people's lives and did a lot of uh, very good things. So we, we appreciate Sam. <clears throat> you know, I, I've been thinking lately that there is a very, very thin membrane between what we know and, and what we don't know. And that part of coming of age and growing up occurs when that membrane gets pricked a little bit. And things that we didn't know suddenly appear in a brighter light or suddenly stare us in the face a little bit or suddenly come to our attention a little bit more. That, that's, that's always an interesting time. Sometimes that relates to some of the most simple things in the world. And it probably doesn't make all that much difference. And so I bet every one of you all can remember when you were young and cars looked very different from each other. And state license plates looked very different from each other. And my father would always prop me up next to him in the front seat of the car. Of course, that's before anybody had ever thought about seat belts. And he would ask you what car that, that is. And then he would ask you what state that license plate was from. And he kind of felt like he had failed in life if you didn't know the difference in a Ford and a Chevrolet and a Plymouth. And we didn't have a lot more than, than that. Or the occasional Cadillac that would drive nearby. And if you learned your states in those days and times, a lot of the state license plates, remember, were made in the shape of the state. So once you learn the map, you kind of can get very, very good at, 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 that, at that process. And then, of course, my father, as soon as my younger brother got old enough, propped him up there, and he did the same thing, and then everything was a contest about who knew the most cars and who knew the most <coughs> license plate. But I thought about my little grandson. He's at that age when that membrane is really moving. And he's up close to it in a lot of different ways. And he's at that stage like all of us were, where there's the realization that there's something out there that's unknown, that he's trying to somehow make sense of, 
but that just didn't really clear yet in some way. And so we get to about six or seven, and boy, that membrane really gets moving. Uh, when he was born, you could give him a toy to play with, and he played with it indiscriminately. And he wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a car and a whatever. But then when he got a little bit older, that membrane opened up a little bit and you could hand him something and he would identify it as a car or a red car or a blue car or a black car. You see the membrane's opening a little bit. And now then, I'll bet he's even beyond some of us in this room because he could talk eloquently and fluently and forever about transformers. <laughs> Those kind of machines that at one point can be a dinosaur and you can do a little magic with them and they become cars. And so there may be ways to talk about cars today that are still behind the shades or still behind the wall of what is known to us. And so constantly the unknowns of life are becoming a little bit better known and the membrane that separates the two is constantly opening up. Okay, with that in mind, a couple of weeks ago, my daughter had this little grandson at the grocery store, and she had corralled him into a shopping cart. That was good for her, that was good for him, that was good for the grocery store. He was corralled within the shopping cart. But there came a moment when her attention was deflected just a little bit. And all of us know it only takes a moment. And she turns back after that moment, and Bradford has reached for something on the shelf, of course. In his reach, he has pushed the shopping cart backward. And as she turns, he's already over the edge of the shopping cart with his head headed toward the floor. And right before his head hits the floor, she grabs him. And she expressed such relief and maybe such joy of his head not striking the floor that he felt it. He felt her emotion. Now, he can't defy an emotion. That's still behind the membrane. He can't give us an understanding lecture about emotion. That's still behind the membrane. But he felt her emotion. And so, in a moment, Bradford said to her, Mama, why were you so glad that you caught me before my head hit the floor? <laughs> why did you feel so good because my head didn't hit the you see what I'm saying? The membrane was pulsating. He was feeling something, but he couldn't exactly understand what it was he was feeling. There was something that was coming out of the unknown into the known, and he was needing a little bit more of an understanding or an explanation. And so my daughter said to him, I'm glad that I caught you before your head hit the floor, because I didn't want you to have to have stitches put in your head. Now, I thought about that. And that seemed perfectly logical and reasonable to me. Doesn't that seem perfectly logical and reasonable to you? In fact, I think my daughter kind of was understanding in what she said that uh, he knows about stitches. And so one time he had a couple of stitches in his hand, and one time he had a couple of stitches in his foot, and so it seemed totally plausible to her, I'm sure, to say, I didn't want you to have stitches in your head. Well, you would think that the conversation should be over, but when that membrane between knowns and unknowns is pulsating, and when a little prick comes in that membrane and there's an opening, it might not be as easily navigated of a situation as you might think. And so, Bradford rides silently through the grocery store for a couple of aisles. And any time that little boy gets silent, you know the wheels in his head are just spinning. <laughs> and so after a couple of aisles, he says, Mama, I need to ask you a question. 
how would those doctors be able to put stitches in my head? How would those doctors be able to see the top of my head? Now you see, that's easy for you. And that was easy for my daughter. And so my daughter said to Bradford, well, they'll sit you down in a doctor's chair and they will put the stitches in your head. They will look down on your head and see your head. Or they'll lay you out on a doctor's table and they'll get at one end where your head is and they'll see the top of your head. Bradford was amazed by the way the membrane went over. And suddenly Meredith understood why. Meredith understood that that little boy had not come to the place of understanding that you could only observe what you could see. And that he could see his hand, that made sense. He could see his feet, that made sense. But you see, he couldn't see the top of his head. Now, I bet you hadn't thought about that today. <laughs> Although I hear people hear of people who gain so much weight they haven't seen their feet in six or eight years. <laughs> I wouldn't know how to relate to that. But this little boy had not understood distant observation. For his life over the last however long, he's thought if you couldn't see something, Nobody else could see it either. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting how that little membrane between knowns and unknowns, understoods and not understoods, isn't it interesting how that kind of plays a role in our lives? But that satisfied him. They finished their trip to the grocery store and they headed home. Meredith said that in the rearview mirror he could tell that she still had something, he still had something on his mind, but he had about exhausted her mother answers for one day. And so they got home. And the minute that they walked in the door, the door had barely closed and Bradford said, I need to talk to Gigi. That's what she calls Phyllis. He calls Phyllis. I need to talk to Gigi. And so my wife is kind of the guru of all things and answer person of all things. And when things get real complicated, you call Gigi. And so Meredith said, just fine. And so she handed him the phone. And he knows how to make that phone work in ways that I can't make it work. And he called his grandmother. And so Phyllis answered. And on the other end of the line, Suddenly it was very clear what else was on his mind, how that little membrane was still kind of pulsating. He said, Gigi, today at the grocery store, my mama said a bad word. <laughs> All of us have been ratted out by our kids. <laughs> and so Phyllis said, with Meredith listening in the background, what did your mother say? And Bradford kind of half whispered because that's what you do with bad words. <laughs> he said, my mama said, oh my God. <laughs> and he's been taught at school that there are bad words. And God is one of those bad words that you don't say like he felt like and like he may have heard his mother say. And so Phyllis is going to help that situation. And so Phyllis says, uh, well, Bradford, what are bad words? And Bradford had a whole story about that. And Bradford said, that's a word that our teachers have explained that we shouldn't be using. And sometimes you ought to just let it go with that. But Phyllis's curiosity went on. And she said, well, Bradford, what are some of these bad words? And he said, God, like Mama said. And then Bradford said, Gigi, there's an S word. 
Did you know that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I knew that. You're right, Bradford. That's a bad word. And then he paused for a minute, and this little six-year-old boy, and he said, there's an F word. <laughs> and said, Timmy whispered it to me and said, his mama says it all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Phyllis says, maybe we didn't need to go down that road that far, and I've learned more than I needed to know. And so then she comes to the rescue, and she says, like I'm sure she said to both of our kids, Bradford, you've got to understand, you see the membrane's got to open up a little bit, that there are ways that you can use the word God that are bad, and your teacher is right. And you should never use God as a bad word. <laughs> but said there are other ways that you can use the word God that's a good way. And there are good ways that you could say, oh my God. And Bradford said, how could you do that? And Phyllis said, like I bet you and I would have said, you can say it as a prayer. And I'm sure that when your mother saw you falling out of that cart and said, oh my God, that she was saying that as a prayer and using the word in a good way. Well, she thought she would fixed everything. But then Bradford comes back and the membrane opens a little bit more. And, Brad, and Bradford says, Gigi, what's a prayer? You don't know that, do you know it? And so the explanation came back. A prayer is when you ask God for something that you think you need. Or a prayer is when you have something that you need God's help with and you ask for God's help. And so when you were falling out of the cart, and your mother yelled, oh my God, she was asking for help. And she was in a moment when she needed God to help her catch you and not let you hear hit the floor. Now this is what I've come to, so listen to this carefully. At that point, having dealt with his membrane being opened in different ways all day long, and unknowns trying to become knowns all day long. And at that point when he had heard loving and caring and for us intelligent explanations all day long, my daughter said that Bradford took his hands and stuck them up in the air and shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't get it. <laughs> And Meredith said, he walked away like he was done. And he turned around and he said, I need to ask Gigi one more question. And he got back on the phone and he said, Gigi, why does God give us teeth? <laughs> but that was it for the day. Oh, Lord, that's right. That's a prayer. Uh, but you know, I have thought about that for two weeks. And I thought about what was happening to him relating to God was probably as natural and as evolution as what would have happened to him in relationship to his knowledge of cars or anything else. But then I've got to think, got to think, that when he was at the point of saying, I don't get it, but he was comfortable in moving forward in his life that he might have been closer to faith than you would ever imagine. Or that it might be even in our adult lives when things happen around us and the best we can get to is I don't get it but then we move on into life. That that may be closer to faith than we would 
ever imagine. The Bible clearly says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, desired, prayed about, wanted, needed, but that are not seen, that are not totally understood, that are not totally explained. And so the little boy says, I don't get it. I haven't had an adequate explanation. I haven't had a thorough explanation. <laughs> I haven't been given a clear understanding. I haven't been told what I need to believe about this. Or I haven't been told what I better believe about this. But you know what's going to happen? Because it happened to every one of us. There's going to come a time in which he will get it. In a way. There's going to come a time in which he starts going to Sunday school and church and he starts listening to what Sunday teachers and preachers have to say. Or there'll come a time in which he starts getting involved in different groups at school or at church and people will sit around in circles or sit around at camps or what all other kinds of things that he'll do and that we probably did. And we'll have all of these things explained. There will come a time in which we begin to read books and we begin to read things on the internet and all of these curious membrane areas of knowns and unknowns that relate to God and to faith. There will be plenty of voices that will tell us what it all means and will explain it and will give us an understanding. We've all been exposed to that and we continue to be exposed to what other people think and other people believe and what authorities think and authorities believe and what great theologians think and great theologians believe and what churches of one variety or another think or churches of one variety of another believe. And, and, and before you know it, we will just be wrapped in a cocoon of explanations and understandings and what other people think and what other people believe. We'll get it. <coughs> but what is it that we'll be getting? We'll be getting explanations and understandings and rationalizations what other authorities and other people from our parents to our preachers and beyond what they think what they believe and what they say and then at some point we'll be asked do we believe do we accept but what we're sometimes really being asked is do we agree with what the church said, or what the preacher said, or what the theologian said, or what mama said, or what daddy said? And agreeing with what someone else has said may be 10,000 miles away from faith. But that's the way faith's been defined for us. And that's the way faith has been given to us. And all of us have come up to that pulsating membrane that on the kind of shady side, unseen side, unclear side, opaque side, is God. But we've not let it be. We've listened to what our mamas and our daddies and our aunts and our uncles and our preachers and our pastors and our theologians and our books and the people on television that talk about that stuff all have to say. And then we've been asked if we agree. And if we've agreed, we've been rewarded. And if we've agreed, we've been affirmed. And if we've agreed, everybody's been proud of us. And if we've agreed, we've been kind of let into the fold. 
Now, I don't want to put that process down because I've been an explainer in my own way, just like all of you have been explainers in your own way. But what I'm wanting to say is that every day of our lives, maybe even especially as we get older, there are times when we're, we're just exactly like my little six-year-old grandson. There are times in every one of our lives in which things happen and we hear all the explanations and if we're totally honest within ourselves, we don't get it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up in a rational way. There's no way to intellectually just totally explain it. But what I'm trying to say is that maybe at that point when we don't get it, and yet we move on, maybe at that point we may be closer to that God hidden behind the membrane of unknown and known. We may be closer to the presence of a loving and caring God than we would ever imagine. My guess is that every one of you in this room, myself included, in 2018, came up against things, experienced things, had things happen to you or somebody you love, that in spite of all of the explanations that you've been given and all of the things that you have agreed with in terms of traditional belief, I believe that in 2018 probably every single one of us in this room came up against something that ultimately we didn't get. And no matter who came explaining and no matter who came telling us to do this, that, or the other to feel better about something, in all honesty, we still didn't get it. And I would imagine that if 2019 is like any other year of life that any of us have experienced, we can pretty much bet that there's something that will happen in 2019 that in spite of all the explanations and all the logic and all the reason and all that anybody said, that we'll still be like that little boy and we'll be saying, I don't get it. And we'll move on. I'd like to encourage you in 2019 to understand and maybe even be a little afraid that there are going to be things that happen that you won't get. We don't like that and we shouldn't, I guess. But I, I'd like to ask you to think about kind of getting in your head and heart that when we get to those points where we don't get it, and yet somehow we're still able to move forward, that those may be times in which we really are close to God. And we really are close to Faith may occur when we don't get it and somehow we're able to move forward. For you see, here I am having dealt with this stuff for decades, just like you. And I don't get the love of God. You kidding? Here I am after decades of every kind of explanation in the world. And I don't get how God could love me enough to send His Son. I could stand up here and give you every membrane-fixing explanation in the world about grace. But I don't get the grace of God. But maybe when we're at the place where we say, I don't get it, and we move on, we may be closer to the God who's ultimately beyond being known and explained and theorized and intellectualized 
than we could ever imagine. When we don't get it, we may be closer to the God that philosophers and theologians and preachers and teachers have talked about until they're blue in the face, trying to help, I'm sure, than we would ever imagine. So as you go into 219, or as we go into 219, and when it happens, and you don't get it, but yet still have some capacity to move forward, you may be closer to faith, and you may be closer to the God who is really there than any God of explanation, or any God of theory, or any God of concept or idea that you've ever heard somebody talk about. I don't get it. And I move forward. And I may be closer to God at that moment than I could ever imagine. And so, night time finally comes, and on his day of membrane probing, it's time for Bradford to go to sleep. And so he goes into his room with his mama, and as they approach his bed, Bradford says, Mama, I want to pray. And so Meredith says, well, of course, Bradford, how do you want to pray? And he said, I saw a picture of a little boy beside his bed. That's how I want to pray. And so this little six-year-old boy gets down on his knees beside his bed, holds his hands like this, and he says, Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. God, good night. <laughs> There's you some faith. Come into the end of your day and you've learned that there's a good way of saying God. And you come to the end of your day and overwhelmed by the majesty of divinity. You say, oh my God, in a good way. And the best you can get to is good night. <laughs> May God help us that we might in 2019 grow in our faith. But understanding that growing in faith doesn't simply mean one more explanation or one more idea or one more rational construct. That growing in faith might be becoming more sensitive to those moments when we don't get it, but something allows us to move on. God may be very, very close, closer than any idea at that moment. Let's pray. Oh Lord, help us to understand somehow that there's a whole lot more to life and that there's a whole lot more to you as our God than just ideas and concepts and theories that we have about you. You're bigger than that. You're more than that. You can never be captured in ideas and theories and concepts, even from the greatest authorities. So help us that we might be in 2019 not more attuned to more ideas, but help us that we might be more attuned to your presence in our lives, a presence that helps us move forward when we don't get it. So help us that we might understand somehow that the greatest and deepest faith is not belief in yet another idea, but the greatest and deepest faith is when your presence and your power, which we are incapable of fully understanding, allows us to step forward. Go with us and help us, for we ask in your Son's name.
Amen. Thank you all. Happy New Year.